Hello and welcome to Lightmap from Sifter. On Lightmap we explore what it takes to make video games an interactive media and you meet creative teams from all around the world. We talk to developers, artists, musicians, researchers, sometimes people who wear lots of different hats. My name is Gianni Di Giovanni and thanks for joining me on this episode. My co-host is Mitchell Lowe. Hey Mitch. Hello. Our guest on Lightmap is Liam Edwards, the game director of Cursed to Golf, a game that's been described as the hardest golf game anyone has ever played. Liam, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so we're going to be learning more about Cursed to Golf, the golf roguelite. Uh, but before we get into that, let's find out what's making the news this week with the top stories on our latest episode of Walkthrough Sifter's news podcast. Hi, my name is Kyle Paletto, and here at Sifter, we're proud to bring you some of the best independent games journalism in Australia. I'm excited to introduce a brand new weekly show to the Sifter roster, a gaming news show called Walkthrough. I'll let you know which company has been bought out this week, all the blockbuster titles that have just been announced, the controversies and the exciting developments every Sunday. I'll also give you an update on the titles out this week and go in depth with some of the biggest stories. I hope you'll join me as I guide you through the news on Walkthrough. Available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you like to listen. Okay, Liam, I've got an important question for you. What sins did I commit to end up in golf purgatory? What could I have done to be a better person? Uh, and what <laughs> is Curse to Golf? Um, the sins, uh, that dance between yourself and golf guard. I can't speak for him. So whatever he decided that meant you were curse to go down to golf purgatory that's uh, between you and him um but don't worry there's always a chance to get out and you uh, you know you've got the chance to redeem yourself um curse to golf is a we call it a golf like uh because it's not quite a golf game and it's not quite a roguelike it's a bit of a like of both of those things um it just started out as this uh, experimental project of my own where i wanted to sort of see why nobody had made a physics-based roguelike before. And uh, the answer is because it's a really stupid idea. Um, because, you know, random generation combined with the most random element of all, which is physics, is not exactly uh, a recipe for a fair and well-balanced experience. Um, but it does lend itself into being able to make this sort of... Uh, the hardest golf game ever made supposedly <laughs> um but yeah it, we got to this moment where now we sort of combined both of them in like ways and now we have Costa golf which is a golf roguelike so tell me about how you play this game what's the setup and, and what will people be doing as they they enter the golf purgatory uh, so the setup is that you are the champ you are the greatest golfer basically of their time and just as you were about to, you know, go down in the annals of golf history by becoming the greatest golfer of all time, uh, just as you're about to strike the last shot, you get struck by lightning and you end up dying and heading down to golf purgatory, which sits uh, just below golf hell. And uh, unfortunately, you are now cursed to golf, which means for all of eternity, unless you're able to make it through the 18 holes of golf purgatory, uh, you will be cursed to play golf forever which for a lot of people i imagine is somewhat like hell uh so yeah you are cursed to play golf for a long long time unless you can get out and the aim of the game is to do that it's to get through 18 holes these dungeon like golf holes uh, using sort of quirky power-ups and arcade golf gameplay and yeah once you get through all 18 you ascend and you get another chance at it yeah so um what were some of your inspirations behind curse to golf I think it's interesting because I don't think when I started Cursed Golf, I, I had any um, idea about copying anything else. It was a case of I was listening to a podcast um, that talks predominantly about roguelikes. And I was just wondering, um, as a thought experiment as a game designer, why nobody has made a physics roguelike. And I started tinkering uh, when COVID hit. I had a lot of free time, as we all sort of did. And I just started prototyping off the back of releasing another project, the company I was working at at the time. And uh, it was just a nice way for me to sort of learn Game Maker again and stuff that I was doing. Um, but then it spiraled into this uh, experience where now I had to actually do a full project of this. And then it was it was not necessarily inspired by other things, but to look at what other roguelikes are doing generally as a standard. And, you know, I've played a lot of them. I'm not very good at them. Um, 
<laughs> so I wanted to make something where I knew I could complete it. And I knew that uh, other people could complete it, even if it is challenging, uh, because it is accessible. And I just kind of wanted to strike a balance between finding what's accessible about roguelikes um, and then what uh, great golf games out there can give you that great golf experience, whether it's like Neo Turf Masters or you know the early Mario golf games and stuff, and sort of combining those uh, with our own ideas. And I feel like we've come to this sort of conclusion now where uh, we've we've kind of hit that. I hope. I've always wanted to know, um, like like most fantastic games, it started off as a smaller project, something you do in your free time. Um, at what point did you make the realization that hey? let's let's commit to this let's make it something that we will release <laughs> mine was mine was quite easy in this instance it was a case that i just made the uh, initial demo prototype just for fun and um i put it on itch.io which is a platform where you can release games and uh posted about it on twitter and then people played it and they liked it and it got written about in some magazines like edge magazine in the uk um just as this fun little quirky you know, thought experiment. And then uh, people offered me money to make uh, a better version of it. So it became a lot easier when that gets, uh, you know, given to you as an option. And then we build a team here at Chuhai Labs. I came over here, we built a team. And then, yeah, I, a year and a half later from then, now we have the launch of the game today. So you moved to Japan mid-development of the game? No, actually, I have been here in Japan for seven years already. Um, I've been in Kyoto for four, so I previously used to work for a studio called Q Games, which were the head of uh, the Pixel Drink series, and I was making games over there. And uh, yeah, when uh, publishers reached out, I thought, oh, here's the chance to sort of do something new and uh, you know, sort of carve out my own future a little bit. Um, can you tell me what was that process like? Um turning it from something that was a small project into something that could be delivered as a full game that is now on every platform that anyone would want to play it on. Um, did you start again from scratch entirely? Was there anything that could be reused? What does that look like? Um, yeah, we did start it uh, again. So the original prototype was built in Game Maker, which is an engine that is great and accessible for people like myself who are not the best programmers in the world uh, and you can do everything in it, but it predominantly is a 2D engine. Um, once we built a team, we got a very talented artist and programmer and musician and stuff like that. that you know, basically, I got to build a dream team of people I wanted to work with. And uh, as soon as that became apparent, it meant that we, we treated it like it's not a hobby project anymore. You, you treat it like it's a professional thing that you have to do for a job. And so we started again in Unity. And the only thing that really carried over was essentially the Genesis idea, which is this golfing roguelike. I think what was very lucky for us was the blueprints were already there. Excuse me. Um, the blueprints were already there from the level designs that I'd done and sort of the basic mechanics. So we had all that. We just rebuilt that in Unity, very, uh, I guess, in, in its predominant early stages. And then we just focused on making it the best it could be, whether it was art or music or uh, the mechanics being now we had an actual very good programmer working on it, it means our limitations were not as limited as when I was doing it because I would just not make stuff because I couldn't program it. Now we could program whatever we wanted and do it. So we experimented a lot. We added stuff like spin into the game and it just completely made it a very, very different game. Let's talk about some of those mechanics and uh, the systems of how it all works because, you know, it is a, a game that you can play through multiple different times and each time you approach it, uh, it's different. Uh, and how do you build a system where there's physics, randomization, and all those little puzzle pieces that come together to to be something that people can complete, complete without pulling all their hair out? Yeah, it's very, very tough. And it, that always was going to be the major problem. Um, balancing those things are, is really, really tough. And... Uh, for us, it, it's about control. So it's how much control you can sway into the balance of the players. So the ace cards are the immediate example of, okay, I'm going to hit a, a random golf shot. I have some general idea where it's going to go, but to make sure it gets there, I'm going to use these things that are going to help me get there, whether it's a ace card like time stop, which allows you to freeze the ball in midair and drop it where you want it, um, or a rocket ball. So it turns into a controllable golf shot. Um, everything was about control and then adding spin into the game, which made it even more uh, so that control is in the player's favor. You can land the ball on a dime if you get good enough at spin. Um, and then with the random generation, we just don't sway too much into random generation. For example, the levels are not randomly generated. They are designed 
but the course is randomly ordered. So the order in which you get the holes, uh, it basically takes from a pool of 70 holes and then randomly makes a course for you. But the, the like uh, difficulty curve is always the same because um, we can control that and we control what cards you get in packs at different times and stuff like that. So yeah, it's about control. Are there any systems in there that you've built in to give people a little bit of a leg up if you notice that they're really struggling? Uh, is that something you've you've built in? Uh, yeah, um, it's it's not necessarily uh, a secret or anything. Uh, it's just very poorly sort of explained, um, but it's something we added to sort of help with that. We have this sort of yellow bar above the player health um, that goes up and sort of combos every shot you land on a fairway. It combos. So if you hit sort of four or five shots in a row without landing in a hazard or using a card, what it will do is it will actually either give you cash or it will give you a plus shot card and then it randoms between plus one or plus two or plus three. Um, so yeah, there are some sort, there are kind of things that help you along the way. We really do want you to finish the game. Uh, it's, we, we don't want it to be the hardest golf game in the world necessarily, but we want it to be fair and a challenge that you are, you know, you feel very satisfied when you've completed it. Um, it's scratching that roguelike itch once you get across the threshold for that first time, then you, yeah, there's nothing, exactly. nothing better, I reckon. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about how the art style came together? Because it's, it's beautiful. It looks like the best, uh, you know, throwback era art you can imagine, but of course it's, it's better than what we could remember because those weren't as good as what we remember, I think. Yeah. It, I mean, I don't want to speak for our artist, John, who's just, his work is incredible. Uh, it's a case of my original vision was that I just thought of Mario Golf cross Castlevania and that aesthetic sort of stuck. And what I said to him was, you know, this is how we started. You know, I want to see your take on it. And he did an amazing job with it. And then we expanded beyond that. It was always going to be pixel art and we always wanted John to work on it. Um, we actually waited uh, three additional months <laughs> for him <laughs> to come on. Um, and yeah, it was the best thing we did. The art style was essentially as just really having fun with it, um, riffing on all the Super Famicom, Super Nintendo games that we used to love so much and uh, really just allowing John to be himself, which is an amazing artist. Um, what were some of the challenges of combining the concepts of golf and platforming? Golf balls fall off platforms. Like That's the problem. Um, so <laughs> actually in the beginning, we were never going to have spin. It was a case that we didn't even think about it. Um, the initial prototypes didn't have it and we would always, you know, find that the ball was just falling off platforms all the time. And um, it kind of sucked because, you know, then the shots, you try to nerf them through physics and stuff like that. And that doesn't work either. Um, so I came in one day after playing uh, some older games and I just thought, I said to our programmer, Sean, you know, can, can we try spin? Like, can we, you know, see what happens if we add this in? And within five minutes, we had a playable demo and it changed everything it changed the level design ideas it changed how we're able to balance the game better uh it really was like a saving grace and it just came out of nowhere in that moment um so without i with i think without spin and that kind of thing our level design would have been very boring because it would have to compensate for the fact that yes golf balls falls off platforms and it's frustrating um so, and the game probably wouldn't have reviewed as well as it did. Uh, so thank, thankfully we had it spinning. Were there any grand plans for any other systems that you wanted to uh, implement, but just didn't make sense or when you played it, it just wasn't fun? Uh, the initial prototype that I made, you could only hit to the right. You could only hit in one direction, which meant you had to bounce the ball off certain angles and stuff like that. And that was always kind of fun because, you know, people like doing the sort of mental math about angles and bouncing them like a pinball. Uh, but when it came to this prototype, it just didn't work. So we just made it a normal golf game. You can hit in any direction you want. And that then again changed the level design because the levels could be more interesting because they're not limited by the fact that you can only hit in one direction. Um, so it, it's less so that things got lost, but things got expanded upon more. Um, and there, yeah, there's a bunch of ace cards and a bunch of power ups that didn't make it stuff that really does break the game. Um, and stuff that, um, there is, I can't, what did we had one called the boomerang at one point and the boomerang, you would hit a shot and if it went in a hazard, it would just boomerang back at you instead. So it would like avoid it and just come back. And it was a case of you could just basically avoid everything and just keep going and stuff. Um, it didn't quite work either. Um, 
and then we had just more powerful versions like double portals and a drill ball that lasted forever. Um, yeah, it's kind of we left basically the most broken powers in. Like we have a drill ball that drills through the ground. Combining that with portals basically means you can hole in one most holes if you're lucky enough. Um, we like when people break the game. So yeah, not much got left out, but there are some things that did. I've been reading a lot of comments now that the game's been out for, I think, less than a day, I think. You know, this yeah, time of reporting. <laughs> 14 hours. <laughs> exactly. 14 hours. Um, a lot of people are really into the soundtrack. They love it. Um, can you tell us about how that came to be? It's a, then again, it's a case of similar to John. It's, I, I just wanted to work with the people who I thought were amazing. And uh, I've been a fan of Mark Sparling, our composer, since he made the A Short Hike soundtrack, which I think is one of the best soundtracks to a video game ever. It like equally is 50-50 with what that game was providing as a game. Um, it really is one of those games where the soundtrack makes almost the enjoyment of the game as much as the game itself. And that can be rare. You know, usually music's just an accompanying piece, not necessarily a standout, but he, his soundtrack was fantastic. And I just followed him on Twitter and he used to make a song every day in Chiptune and it was awesome. I couldn't believe he'd make such great songs in just like an hour. And I, when I was making the prototype, he was doing some sort of charity thing and he asked people to donate money um, to Black Lives Matter. And if they did, he would make a song. So I took the opportunity to be like, hey, I'm very happy to donate. And also, uh, if you wouldn't mind, I'm making this prototype. Uh, and the brief is just Mario Golf Cross Castlevania. Can I hear what you do? And he made an amazing song that was in the original prototype. And uh, then once it became a case of if this game ever gets signed and we want to make something out of it, you will always be the musician for this. And I, it was the best decision ever because the soundtrack is amazing. And the stuff he'd send us was incredible. Um, and yeah, so I'm not surprised by all those comments, to be honest. Um, one of my favorite things about the way that this game has been released out into the world is how you've shared it online and your little videos you've been putting together as part of this marketing thing. They just crack me up and you've got really funny. <laughs> That's great. Um, Thank you. How much of that was just, you know, cold corporate strategy to sell a video game and how much of it is just what you love doing when you're making games? If I'm entirely honest, it all comes out of us being quite frustrated with the cold corporate things not doing enough. Um, you know, even working with publishers, publishers have a lot of games to think about, not just your own, right? But to you, your own game is yours and yours only. And like, that's all you care about. So we want to make sure we give it the fair dues it is. And myself and Mark, our producer, we used to work together at, a, at that previous company, Q Games. And even there, we would make silly videos, you know, quirky content just for fun. Mark is an incredible content creator and he's, he, the editing style of the videos is all him. That's his style. And uh, so, yeah, it was a case of just carrying on that. And I don't mind being in front of the camera. You get used to it after a while. So we thought, oh, we'll just go for it. And uh, yeah, then every time we just stand in front of a camera, say a bunch of dumb things. We're very proud of our game. So why not? We wouldn't hide. And then, yeah, uh, Mark edits the hell out of it and makes it look good. Yeah, they're a lot of fun, and I think we might put a little bit of a clip of this so people can watch if they're watching on YouTube Heck yeah. um, about what it looks like. Um, Liam, can you tell me, when you're making this game, um, what were some of the things that you were really proud of um, that you know can be proud of other members of the team or things that you contributed yourself um, that really made the difference to you? So as, as people are playing, they look out for it and they go, that's that's a bit of love right there. You're right. It's, it's entirely the team. Um, We've seen the version of Coaster Golf that would be made if it was just me, right? It was the first one. And it, and compared to this one, it is an insignificant, tiny amateur project compared to what this golf game is now, the game that is getting these reviews. Um, it's entirely down to the team and what they do with it, whether it's, you know, John making these small, tiny enemies, like when the golfer is on a ledge, he sort of like hovers and stuff, like he's like about to fall over. Um, and the music from Mark, whether, you know, He's trying to blend like Scottish themes into some form of like spooky Halloween thing. There's a lot of love from all of us because we all got to put our own creativity in each area that we did. Um, so I think I'm just proud that I was allowed to get all these people together and allow them to express themselves. And 
when they when I hear them talk about it online or like when they put it in their bios and they're very proud to have worked on it, that that makes me very happy as a director because that's all I really want is them to be proud of the project they've made. This is obviously not your first game that you've made, but I'm curious what uh, lessons have you learned from previous games uh, that you brought into this when you were making it to you know make it the the team that you want it to be and then the project uh, that you wanted it to be. You've always got to treat it professional, like regardless of what game it is, it could be the silliest game in the world um, or a game like this where it's a very silly golf game, but you have to treat it professionally. You have to uh, come in every day and, and have tasks and do them. And everyone has to be accountable for those things. And uh, I think games, game production works very well with a, with a structure. So having some sort of uh, a hierarchy of people who know what they're doing in their certain areas and they have the last call or last say on those things is really important because that's how you stay as a cohesive piece. You know, if everyone just, you know, the, the old adage of design by committee, I don't think that works very well. Um, so you have to, uh, almost have somebody to say no, which is really hard. Um, but in the end that does work because the cohesive nature of a game comes out and then you're like, oh yeah, this feels like the thorough line stays the same throughout. And that is a case of, you know, everybody being on like trends with each other. Um, so structure and professionalism, I think is really important still, but like if you're not having fun making it, then how is anybody going to have fun playing it, right? So if you're not having fun making it, then maybe stop making it. Um, so one important thing for us was just to have fun. The game is out now, um, and there's no doubt, and there's no, there's no, there's no question that it's a critical success. How does that make you feel? It's weird because a couple of weeks ago, if you'd said that to me, I would have like bitten off your hand just to have known that. Um, because you worry about how the final thing is going to turn out. And it is kind of a very strange thing where people say, you know, you make it for yourself. Um, in the last couple of days, maybe in the last week or so, because I know how the game has turned out as a final piece, I actually wasn't that worried because I'm proud of it. So people could have written a 3 out of 10, a 4 out of 10, and I still would have called them liars because I'm very proud of it. And I'm very proud of the team that made it. Uh, but then last night before the reviews hit, you get nervous again because the reality is, well, you want to do well because it allows you to make games in the future and it allows you know the team to have opportunities to do bigger and wonderful things in the future too. Um, so it is a relief that that all went well. But what I'm also very proud of is the fact that we did something that nobody's done before, really. Not to be big-headed about it, but I, I don't think there is another game like Costa Golf. And I think a lot of people look at the trailers and they're like, huh, interesting, but I've never seen anything like it. So therefore, I don't think they can pull that off, right? Um, and this almost says, ah, oh, they did pull it off. Wow, what a surprise. Like combining a golf roguelike, like golf and roguelike did work. Um, so fair play to them. Uh, yeah, so that does feel pretty good today. Are there any secrets hidden in the game that players with eagle eyes should be keeping an eye out for? Either, you know, Easter eggs or other cool things that people can find if they're super keen. The game is totally full of references. Like it, it, there is, whether it's the outfits of the game, I think a lot of them, uh, they're spelled very bluntly. Like uh, there's outfits that are references to things. Uh, there's card uh, text that's references to stuff. And uh, there's even little art references to old games that I've made or John has made or things that John likes that he's hidden that even I don't know about. So yeah, there is definitely a lot of things in there that people can find. And uh, I guess, what are some of your pro strats and tips that we can use to, uh, if we want to be the champ, we want to get out of purgatory? Use your cards. Like, uh, don't, don't worry about it. You'll get more. Um, so I think a lot of people have like Phoenix Down Syndrome in games like this, where they're worried about using their resources. Uh, the game is about using resources and we balanced it so that we hope that you'll get lots of cards because using the cards is the fun part. Uh, so we don't want to be stingy and keep all the cards and make sure you have, you know, you're very particular about using them. So use the cards. Um, the other thing is that finishing a hole with, uh, more shots. So you start every hole with five, but the more shots you finish with, uh, the more cash you get at the end of the hole. Uh, and the more cash means the more cards you can buy in the shop. So, you know, you can buy those booster packs, 
and, and get as many cards as you want. Uh, and also get uh, good at the active cards. So we have cards in the game like U-Turn and, and Time Stop and uh, Rocket Ball and stuff like that that require actual bits of skill to do. Like they're kind of double-edged. They're very, very powerful, but they do require skill to use. So get good in the driving range at using those. And then like the course, you'll be eating away at it easily. Like no problem. And I know we're only just, the game's just come out uh, and you're probably looking forward to having a bit of a, a gap or here there, but is there plans for expansion? Is this something you'd like to, to, to build on more uh, for a future world of Curse to Golf? Heck yeah. Like we're very proud of the game. We don't want it to just end here you know we're already talking about how depressed we are the fact that it's out right you get this weird depression at these moments where it's like i can't believe it we don't work on it at the moment um there's a whole bunch of things that we we didn't do uh whether it's multiplayer or level editors or whatever um that we'll talk about in the future that we do want to add but unfortunately these things are always tied to what is the success of the project and 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 that the reality isn't there yet what we don't know um, but we do. We, we do want to do it for as long as we can, yeah. Well, the game is called Curse to Golf. It's out now. If you're listening to this, uh, you can pick it up on PC, on Steam, Epic, and on GOG, or any of the consoles, Switch, PlayStation, or Xbox. Liam, thank you so much for being part of this episode. It's been great to chat to you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, Sifter is produced by Nicholas Kennedy, Fiona Bartholomew, Daniel Ang, and Adam Christou. Mitch Lowe, who is my co-host on this episode, is senior producer. Thank you, Mitch. Hey, no worries. Thanks. Uh, haven't been on one in a while, but it's good to be back. And my name is Gianni Di Giovanni. I'm the executive producer. Thanks to Omni Studio for their support of Sifter's three podcasts. And you can find links to everything that we talked about on our website, which is sifter.com.au, where you can read more about the games and the guests that we've featured. And uh, while you're at it, uh, we also have the Sifter community. Uh, so if you've enjoyed this, uh, you can uh, share your creative work with others. Um, it's a very chill space. It's a Discord server um, to join. Visit sifter.com.au forward slash Discord uh, to get in there. That's sifter.com.au forward slash Discord. And uh, if you want to help us out, please share the show. It's the number one free thing you could do to support us. Uh, word of mouth is really important to indie podcasts like this one. Uh, so let your friends know if you think they'll like it. That's all for now. Until next time, have fun. Have fun.